driving from hell Blue skies from pain Can you tell the green field From a cold steel breath A smile from a veil Do you think you can tell Did they get you to train Your heroes for gold Hot ashes for trees, hot air for a cool breeze, cold comfort for change. Did you exchange a walk on port in the war for a lead role in a cage? We have never played before, and these are all songs that we have never played before. <laughs>
by the way if I don't get it finished my P.O. will be P.O.'d whoa oh help me please mama I got the annual report blues oh replication sites are lazy my co eyes are drunk If I don't get this report done I think that I am sung My project's lacking data 
my evaluator told me so. The annual report of blues Make him cry, Dougie. Hopefully every whoa, back up a little. Hopefully everybody was here and heard that. I, I definitely think we need a reprise on the ATE annual report blues. Uh, <laughs> so it's it's my privilege this morning to introduce my boss, um, Dr. Susan Singer. Uh, she is the division director for undergraduate education. She's from Carleton College, and she is a, a plant geneticist. So um, she also is very, very invested in STEM education, understanding best teaching practices, and is a real proponent for the ATE program. So with a very, that brief, very, very brief introduction, I'm going to introduce Susan. ATE is an incredibly innovative community, but I think this morning may be ATE at its most innovative best. Um, so before I introduce our um, speaker and facilitator for the morning, I wanted to challenge all of you in this very innovative community to think about how you, um, and for the students here, some of your fellow students that aren't here, could take advantage of our Community College Innovation Challenge. So I know you won't be able to see this when I hold it up, but it's a postcard 
that talks about the AACC NSF Community College Innovation Challenge that started October 15th and runs through February 15th of 2016. Um, and it's looking at innovation in the nexus of food and energy and water systems. And there is a huge stack of these cards at the registration desk. If you could pick them up, they're also on the NSF and the AACC websites and spread the word. We, this is the second Community College Innovation Challenge. The first was just amazing. Um, some of the schools that participated are here and I'm sure we'd be happy to tell you about it. But the work that the students did, as Walter Bumpus pointed out last night, just blew us all away. Um, and we're expecting to be even more surprised this year. The wonderful thing about it um, is that everybody gets recognized. So the semi-finalists, their um, the little videos that they put together are put permanently on a website where um, you can add that to your resume and it's still there as a student. And then um, they get to come to Washington and we have a boot camp where you learn how to take your ideas um, forward in a very entrepreneurial way. We had an event on the Hill. We set a record for NSF tweets and we believe a record for um, members of Congress that actually came by. That's just how powerful community college students can be. So please join us for that. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing some of you or your fellow students there this summer for the, the boot camp and we'll look forward to seeing your entries. That said, um, in the spirit of innovation, we're trying something new this year. This panel features an ATE project that is truly interdisciplinary and has engaged, I think, 35 states, over 300 secondary and community college faculty have been engaged so far. It, it's incredibly exciting to see what all of you can make happen. And in order for this panel to go forward, um, we've invited, again, one of our most innovative thinkers in the community to facilitate the panel um, and help you hear all the different perspectives about this work. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce Donald McCoy, who is now a K to college STEM education consultant. But Donald has had a, probably a three, 30 year um, career at IBM with all sorts of experience as a senior engineer, working with people, process, projects, and program management. Uh, just an incredible history. And there's lots of details about Donald in your program brochure. I hope you'll take a look at that as well. Um, in the last decade of his career at IBM, he was focused on K to college initiatives and outreach programs designed to develop um, and retain a diverse population of talented students in the workforce. He's been engaged with the ATE community in innumerable ways over the years, and it's a tremendous honor for us to have um, Donald McCoy here with us today. In 2010, he created the Donald McCoy and Associates um, Limited Liability Corporation. He has business clients and partners um, that encompass educational institutions, government agencies, corporations, and nonprofits, and really epitomizes that entrepreneurial spirit that we see in so many of the students and the faculty that are engaged in ATE. You know, we always wonder, you know, at the this point in someone's very illustrious career, I think especially for the students out there, you know, well, that's great, but, you know, do I even dare to aspire to such heights? Well, you know, you start someplace. And um, Mr. McCoy started his education at the College of Albemarle um, Community College in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, and earned his associate's degree in electronics technology. 
And then he went on to Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia, where his bachelor's degree is in electrical engineering technology. So, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to be around three decades from now, but it's kind of fun to imagine which one of you out there may be up on, on this platform facilitating another very innovative um, session. But for now, it's a really an honor to have Donald McCoy here. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Good morning, ATE. Now you tell me the National Science Foundation can't rock. When was the, and this is innovation, right? When was the last time you attended an NSF grant meeting, as well as evaluators and others engaged in a single focus objective to help give back in things that we know are so important to our global society, workforce, engaging young minds having the opportunity to stand up, as you're going to hear in just a moment, and play guitars. <laughs> Faculty, students, but not only just perform, but to understand the STEM behind it, to have the courage to say, I don't play guitar, but I can make one. I understand the mathematics behind it now. I understand how all of the materials come together. I understand the industry leaders and what they now face in making guitars work. In this very building, many of you have probably noticed that the Beatles were here in the early, in the early years when they were traveling here to the States. And today, you're gonna have some fine individuals, which I will invite up now to come on up and take their seat. Uh, we're going to get engaged with their journey, with their story, similar to what the Beatles went through. And I use that in an innovative way. Uh, what you have experienced this morning so far is only the tip of the iceberg. Now you're gonna hear about their journey. You're gonna hear about their successes. You're gonna be able to recognize how you and your community can do something similar. Over 35 states have now engaged in the process of building an assembly, as you well saw into the video, guitars. Not only at the college level, but the high school level, as well as middle school. So we're gonna hear from them. Thank you so very much. So we have a lot to cover this morning, so I'm gonna get right to it. We're gonna have each of the uh, members presented here to give their name, uh, their affiliation with their school or institution, um, their city, just a, a little bit of background about yourself. Not a lot of detail because we're going to get into that. And we'll start with Dave on end. Okay, good morning. I'm Dave Parker. I'm a physics teacher and electric guitar building teacher at Noble High School in North Berwick, Maine. Good morning. I'm, oh. good morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm William Stewart and I go to Noble High School and I took his class in ninth grade. Hi, I'm Nancy Wilson Chang, and I'm a math teacher and STEM guitar teacher at Edmonds Heights K-12, which is an alternative public school in the greater Seattle area. I'm Angela Cordero, and I'm affiliated with Edmonds Community College. I did a week-long guitar building class where I played that guitar over there. <laughs> I'm Doug Hunt from Southern Wells Community Schools in Northeast Indiana. I'm a co-PI on the grant and have been involved uh, from the very beginning of the project. Tim Wilhelm, uh, program coordinator and instructor of electrical technology at Kankakee Community College, and I have my own ATE project, Project C4, Community Colleges Confronting the Conundrum. <laughs> I'm Chris Salmons. I'm a graduate of Kankakee Community College. I was a student of Tim's. This is my mentor, um, and I took the STEM guitar project in the spring. I'm Sean Hawes. I'm a technology teacher at the Grower School in Encinitas, California, and I actually just transitioned to a new job in the IT department at San Diego State University. And I was the teacher for this guy. I am Eric Gutz. I'm a uh, electrical engineering, computer engineering student at Bradley University, and I was this guy's student. 
<laughs> That's good. Thank you all. Let's give them a hand. You in for a treat. If you thought the performance was good, just, just check this out. First question goes to the student. And that is, did you have any musical background or interests uh, in playing the guitar before taking the class? Starting with, uh, with um, William. No, I never thought about playing guitar. I like to, I like to use hands-on stuff, but I never thought about actually making a guitar or playing it. And I really got to learn a lot. <laughs> Andrew. Uh, yes, I've been playing guitar for 12 years, and um, I haven't gotten any better or anything. But <laughs> I, I definitely enjoy trying to play. Uh, and I've always been interested in woodwork and everything, and this was just kind of combining two of my passions. So that was really fun. <laughs> um, my father is a blues guitarist. He played my entire life. Um, I tried to learn a few times, and I don't have the dexterity or patience for it, or didn't. Um, but building the guitar, which I gave to him, was uh, a perfect opportunity to really merge something that was a fundamental part of me and an excellent opportunity in education. <laughs> um, before I started the guitar building program, I joined the music class two years before and I started playing the electric bass. So I thought that maybe building a guitar would you know, help me learn how to play better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this question goes to Nancy. Tell us about your earliest memories of engaging in the STEM Guitar Project. And give us a small history if you can. My earliest memories, okay. Well, um, I, I, first, I built my first guitar, um, I think it was in 2012, so we're not going too far back. But um, um, I'll have to say, I'm a math teacher. I teach algebra and geometry and you know things like that. And um, I had never, I, I have to say, I don't think I had hardly even used an electric drill in my life. I, I'm not a tool person. I, I don't fix things and, or anything like that. But when I heard about the project, which was through um, another uh, STEM organization in Washington State, um, I, I just knew that that was the project. I'm always looking for something that will engage my students and let them see what math is for, um, why we're learning it, and not just because it's a, a graduation requirement. But um, anyway, so um, my teaching partner and I were the only women in the class, um, and so we felt really nervous at first, but the way the curriculum's laid out and the way the, um, the instruction and the structure of the project is, by the end of the week, we, I built a guitar in a week. This is the way we work the summer institutes. Um, it was probably one of the most challenging things I had ever done, but every step of the way, all I could think about was I can't wait to get back and do this with my students because I knew they would feel the same empowerment and passion for it that, that I did. And by the end of the week, I felt like a different person, like it was life-changing. I felt like I can use any machine in the room. I know um, how things work now and what they're for. And, and I've always loved guitars. I, I played guitar as a child, but um, uh, you know, I'm not a rock star or anything. You didn't see me on the stage, but um, I love guitars. And so this gave me a way to also incorporate music and things that I love and that I know my students love. And um, anyway, so that's my history with the project. And I've been teaching that at my school now for, uh, this is the fourth year. We teach it as a semester long workshop uh, for high school students. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so very much, Nancy. Doug, same question. What are some of your earliest memories and how have it impacted you? Uh, early memories, uh, there was a, a National Science Foundation grant prior to this one <clears throat> where we built guitars and I had been invited to, to participate on that from very early on. And um, it kind of got my start, uh, having been playing the guitar for a long time, like had a guitar that was getting worn out. And rather than get ambitious and do some experimental work on it that I didn't know what I was doing, I thought, well, maybe I should build a guitar first. I got stuck. Uh, and through a, a wonderful sequence of events, I found myself at Purdue University, where Mark French um, was holding a, a guitar workshop open to the public. Um, and by the time I went to the workshop, I had gotten over those hurdles and finished my guitar, but it was still a wonderful experience to be able to get to see all the things that I'd learned about reinforced on site with, with, this, with this other group of folks. 
and a bunch of the people there were educators, and they said, hey, by the way, we've got a National Science Foundation grant application we're working on, and we know that we need some high school input and involvement, so you know, when we we're gonna have a meeting in October, we'd love if you would come back. And it's just been like a sequence of dominoes that one has pushed over the next to get us here to this point today. Uh, it has been an amazing trip. Beautiful. Sean, anything to add or your perspective? Um, yes, yeah, similar. Uh, I, I joined an institute, I think back in 2012, uh, with the, the math department chair and I did it together, so technology and math. Um, and we came back and we did three years of guitar building and the program lives on even though I transitioned to another school. So mm -hmm. happy to see that continue. Okay, let's, let's close this train of thought with Dave. Dave, there's a program that's, that you are involved in that giving recognition in terms of a diploma. Can you give us some history behind that? Certainly. Um, as, a, as a physics teacher at the high school, we had fought very hard to get a four-year science requirement at our school, so every single student has to pass physics to graduate. And as a physics teacher, I sort of recognized that some of my students weren't likely to go on to become physicists. And a lot of them had more musical interests. So I went to the uh, NSTA conference one year and saw this guitar building program and realized instantly, this is a program I could bring back to our school and I could reach out to a group of students that I wasn't serving well and get them interested in the science, in the physics, and the math behind this. Uh, so I, I uh, took the program, brought it back to our school. I had already been working on getting our school to do a broader STEM involvement. I'd, I'd been in a governor's academy previously, and as my project, I took it on to get more STEM courses into our district. I started a robotics class. I started an engineering class. But once I saw this guitar building class, I realized I could reach out to a broader group. And I pulled that in, and I met with our principal. I handed off the robotics and engineering classes to other teachers. I started up this, and then we took this, and we went to the school board, and we proposed it as the springboard for opening up a diploma, a STEM endorsement on our diploma, sort of like a major in college, where they'd graduate from high school, but with a concentration in STEM. And from that, we had to go and look at other programs, but that was the jumping off point for our school and our district to really get the program moving. And this year we now do have a STEM endorsement on the diploma for our students to go through it. We've broadened the program to give a lot more options. But this guitar building program really was the turning point uh, that made that, po made that possible in our school. Beautiful, thank you. Let's, let's transition to the students. Uh, Eric, you've matriculated. Give us a little bit of information about your transition and some of your most memorable involvement with the program. Um, my most memorable part of guitar building, the two years that I was in it, uh, yeah, I like just being able to have fun with my friends. So I introduced three of my friends the second year I joined to the guitar building program and they were all not interested at the start but they all played music. And then at the end, I could see him smile with their new built guitar. And uh, I don't know, I just felt happy inside, I guess, because I introduced three non-math science kids into a whole new world, and now they're better because of it. So that's the most memorable part. Now, you in college now, <laughs> right? Tell us, about, tell us about your college. So I attend Bradley University, and I've only been there for two months now. I'm a freshman. Um, and I think because of what I've done in high school, guitar building and robotics, it's moved me into where I am now. So right now I'm working under my professor, Dr. Maya, and I'm working on a little robotics project for his research. And uh, I think without guitar building and robotics, I wouldn't have been here and I wouldn't be having fun in engineering. <laughs> That's good. Chris, same question. Give us a, a feel for your involvement, impactfulness that the program has had in your life. Uh, in terms of the impact, uh, it just opened, similar to what he was just saying, it, it just opened an entire new realm of possibilities where I had come off of a previous business degree and then went into the electrical engineering or electrical, industrial electrical tech field and was learning all sorts, of, that was brand new to me as well, and 
while I was just gaining my footing, <laughs> it could be very overwhelming, the technical side of it, when you're not coming from that. And so for me, STEM really just rounded out everything that I'd been studying. And the STEM guitar building is just an excellent way to, I mean, who doesn't love music? Everybody has a connection to music and it's just a great catalyst for engaging people in a way that it catches people by surprise. You're like, oh, awesome, I'm gonna build a guitar. Oh yeah, by the way, <laughs> there's some math and some science and here's some calculations. <laughs> but it worked out really well to just sum up and just totally round out everything that I've been studying and bring it all together in a way that obviously communicates and resonates with people on a deeper level. For me, that's how it felt. That's great, thank you. So Angela, give us a feel for what it was like being on stage mm -hmm. and then have this reflection back to actually starting with a block of wood and all of the mechanics from the engineering design processes and all of the engagement from manufacturing and glues and, and all these materials to where you are today. Take us down that journey. <laughs> All right, well, settle down. <laughs> uh, well, to me, it's just surprising, you know, like you said, it comes from big block of wood, you know, um, some metal parts, some glue, and all this, you know, a couple of days later, I have this guitar that I can play and share with you, play on the stage. And, um, I mean, I never thought I would be able to do something like this. I, I liked woodworking, and I always liked science and math and everything, um, but I never knew uh, that it could be applied this way. And for me, I mean, just to add on to your sentiment, it really does kind of complete that whole picture. Um, especially for younger students, I think, in high school. Uh, one thing that really stood out to me was giving the ownership into, you know, their own learning plan. Giving them that thing and being able to make something that's completely theirs while applying all these really complicated, um, you know, equations, uh, complicated geometry, uh, all the electronic stuff, you know. Um, it really brings it together, and at the end, that can be something you're just, you're proud of. You can't believe you did it, and that's how I feel. <laughs> that's good. Thank you so very much. So, Tim. Yes, sir. You gave us some blues a moment ago. <laughs> Talk to us about some of the challenges, problem solving, and the like. Give us a deeper dive into the experience from the student perspective and then from the faculty perspective. Challenges. Um, I honestly didn't have many challenges. To, to tell you the truth. Uh, the first time I heard about this was at one of these PI conferences and I saw the showcase and Tom was there and, and I thought, holy cow, what a brilliant idea this is. And as expressed by somebody else, I had to bring it back to the college. And I was pretty easily able to convince the administration to let me create a STEM guitar course at the college. What made it easy and what might be a challenge for other people if they don't have this, is I already had in our program a technical elective that was pretty open. It was called Special Projects. And I convinced my dean to let me use that Special Projects course shell uh, to launch the STEM guitar course at our college. And they were all for it. Um, they got some, I don't know where they came up with the money with today's budget, but they came up with money for me to buy a bandsaw and drill press and sanders and the whole thing. Uh, I went through storage at the college and physical plant turned me loose and I just scavenged as much as I could from the, from the old storage building and uh, the, oh, here's the challenge. I put in a lot of unpaid time to do this. <laughs> That's, that was the big challenge. Uh, but it was fun for me just putting the whole thing together. And uh, when it was done, uh, boy, the students just rock and rolled, Chris being one of them. That's good. Thank you so very much. So, Doug, take us back to this side of getting local support, getting community engagement, industry. How did that work? Give us uh, a perspective of connecting the dots. Yeah, I, I teach in a very small rural community. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll be upfront in saying that there was no um, involvement from any local businesses or anything. Um, school support. Uh, took maybe like a, a 90 second conversation. Um, you know, I've got a terrific building principal who's told me on a number of occasions, Doug, you know, I trust you. And I know that um, if there's something that you wanna do, it's gonna, it's gonna be for the benefit of the students. 
And so, you know, if there's something that you want to do, um, go for it. Um, he, he and I had done a book study last year about um, uh, Invent to Learn and the whole idea of the maker movement in the classroom. And so backing up several years ago to when I first started doing the guitars, he's already on the lookout for new and innovative things for kids to do to spark their creativity and spark their imagination. And by golly, this certainly captures all those, all those points. So it was very easy to, to win him over and to show him what I wanted to do. Um, and the kids actually drug me into this. I didn't want to do this with students, as a matter of fact. Um, and then that might sound really goofy. We're all standing here talking about its virtues and how wonderful it is. Um, this was a personal thing for me and this was a hobby and I, and I already give so much of myself during the school day and the school year that I thought, I need to have something that's my territory. <laughs> and there were other plans for me <laughs> um, that wasn't gonna go that way. And so I was kind of drug into this and I said, okay, I'll do this if these things happen. And all those things happened in a very, very, very short period of time. Okay, we're building, the, we're building guitars. And the kids' enthusiasm um, from day one was infectious and incredible. And like everybody else has said so far, it, it really does, it's, a, it's the convergence of all these separate elements and aspects that come together. And the guitar is kind of like the pinnacle of that. And you look at that and you say, there's the math, there's the art, there's the science, there's the music, there's all, all the other things that go into it. Good. William. Give us a typical day for you in working uh, and engaging in your traditional classwork, entering into the guitar class, and how all of that fits together. And more importantly with this question is how is it linking to other classes that you, you are taking in terms of the learning and transfer of knowledge from one to another? Um, my typical day. <laughs> well, I took this two years ago, so I wasn't really doing much, it was just regular math and regular science classes. And then I got into this class and I learned more like advanced sciences and more advanced math class, math types. And I really had to think more because I didn't know this science or math yet. And he and Mr. Parker and the other teacher, Mr. McCormick, they just walked us through it and helped us out. and it made me realize that I really liked working with my hands. <laughs> and not so much math, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the math was all right. Angela, same question. How is it influencing your, your, your typical class day? Uh, my typical class mm -hmm. day? Well, it's been a while since I was a student, but uh, so I took this uh, guitar building class just this summer. Um, and uh, what a typical day, you know, looked like for us was, uh, for me mostly, it was learning how to use the tools and everything. That was a big learning experience for me. Um, and I can say that uh, coming out of the class, I feel so much more confident. Um, I, like, you know, I can, I know how to use a drill now. I can finally build that spice rack. <laughs> Chris, and then Eric, anything you want to add to that? I, I think... Just the only thing that I can add is just that um, the typical day for me involved a lot of patience and breathing techniques. Um, <laughs> I mean, but yesterday's theme definitely was problem solving. And for me, that was the biggest experience of it was one little mistake. I mean, you are, you are forever changing a physical object. And one little mistake is very obvious at some point. So correction of that involves a, a deeper level of problem solving. And so for me, that was a daily challenge, was just, oops, and then, okay, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Breathe and then fix it. And that, that was pretty much the biggest part. Well, and let me make sure that I, I'm phrasing this question and, and what I'm really trying to get. Say you were in a math class, yeah. Oh, yeah. and now related back to yeah. the math that you are using in measuring out the fret right, distances right, right. and the, the geometry of the shape sure. of the guitar. Go ahead. Um, I really, so I was in the class in ninth and 10th grade and at the time I was in algebra one and uh, I wasn't learning what we were learning in guitar building and by the time we started to learn that in 11th and 12th grade, I was so far ahead of everyone else and I feel like that was an extra bonus. And uh, a little bit about my week is that uh, 
I, it was only a weekly class, and it was at, on Friday for three hours after school. And no one really wants to stay after school on a Friday. You want to, like, get the hell out of there. But uh, um, I wanted to stay because I loved guitar building so much. And I just wanted to stay even more to, get to, to build more of the guitar until the next Friday. That's good. Nancy, let's talk about sustainability and how that's working at your uh, institution and how your faculty is buying in. Because one of the things I know on many of your minds is like, how will you really integrate this and how do you sustain this into your traditional program? Okay. Well, since, um, you know, I was, before the STEM guitar project came into my life, I was teaching, you know, traditional math classes all day long. And I needed to sell it to my administration for, you know, how to justify that I'm giving up two sections in my day of traditional math teaching <laughs> to be able to teach STEM guitar um, because we teach it in two hour blocks. We meet twice a week for two hour blocks. So that's you know one whole algebra class and one whole geometry class that I'm not gonna be teaching so we can build guitars. Mm -hmm. So it sounds, so at first it's like, well that sounds really cool, but you know how can we justify this because we're paying you to teach math. Well in the beginning I had to just kind of go on a lot of faith and say, because I, you know, I think, you know, getting them more engaged is going to help them to learn. Um, but it really, what it, for us, what it boiled down to was the assessment piece. And I don't know about you guys, but in Washington State, um, teacher evaluations are tied to student growth goals. And so we have to make a student growth goal and then chart it throughout the year. And then in the end, present it back to our principal. And that's how you're evaluated. So last year, um, after, this is after I'd been teaching guitar building for a few years and trying to figure out how to sustain it in our program, I needed to really show that this was worth the money and the effort and the sacrifice of less traditional math classes. So what I did was I, I, tie, I, I, made, I proposed that students in guitar building class would improve or increase their scores and um, uh, productivity and performance in traditional math classes. And I had a lot of the same students last year that would be in, say, Algebra one or Geometry that were also building guitars, so it worked out really well. Um, and what we found was just more than I imagined. I knew in my mind that my guitar building kids were doing better in math as the year went on. I could, you could just feel that, but I hadn't actually charted it. And um, by the end of the year last year, we found that um, really every single student in traditional math class who was also building a guitar improved by you know, several percent points, whether it was 10% or 100%. Kids that hadn't been performing at all now were. And I, don't, I guess I can't really say for sure it's because maybe they learned, like as um, Eric was saying, that um, some of the kids are in Algebra one. The math we're doing in guitar building is much more advanced beyond that but somehow in the context of the project, they just, you know, as Chris was saying, they, they just tackle that. Well, I haven't learned this yet, but I really need to, I wanna make my guitar because I love it so much. And, and so they're willing to learn, like, show me how to do this. And they get back to their regular math classes and there's no longer that question of what's this for and why am I learning it? And anyway, it made a big impact at my school um, that we now have data on. And so that sold our administration. And just this past week, I had a principal from another big high, of the big traditional high schools in our district um, contact me and saying, um, we want to do this STEM guitar program at our school. We heard that your students were improving their scores in math by building guitars. <laughs> so for our district, that was the big selling point that I'm looking forward to following up on next week. <laughs> Good, thank you very much. So Dave, let's talk about 21st century skills. Um, how have they been influenced with your program? And I'll ask the same question to the other faculty, time management and the like. Well, on the uh, 21st century skills, we have, this is a one semester course at our school, which means students have maybe 50 to 55 hours with our class in order to get an entire guitar built. And if you're reasonably good at it, 40 hours is about a minimum. So we have to 
have students keep on pace and recognize what they're doing, so they have to recognize you can't just spend all of your time on this one function. You have to move along. You have to accomplish things. For doing some of the math, when we're looking at the fretboard spacing, we're teaching them how to write spreadsheets. Many of them have never written spreadsheets before, so we're getting them using different tools. One of the things I find is a biggest change for the students. You can learn how to use a drill, press, and a saw by taking two by fours and plywood and building a wooden box. You can learn how to use those tools. But in guitar building, you learn how to use those same tools, but you're using them to build a superbly finished musical instrument. And that level of expertise and attention of not just doing something, but doing it extremely well and putting the attention to detail into it and really taking the time to set it up and take that pride in the finishing of it, I find that that attention to detail and pride uh, really comes through in this course better than I've seen anywhere else. So let me, let me advance that question just a little bit. Let's talk about the industry involvement here. Who would be best to, to give me some enlightenment in that? Who give us some enlightenment? I, I might okay. be able to speak to that. Go for it. Um, you know, we've got a, an advisory board uh, that consists of uh, representatives of leading guitar manufacturers, uh, companies like Taylor Guitars, uh, Martin and Fender uh, chiefly, and also Seymour Duncan uh, is an aftermarket uh, electric guitar pickup manufacturer and the OE OEM manufacturer too for certain lines. Um, and you know they're very keenly interested, uh, as as is uh, stringed instrument supplier Stuart McDonald, who is another partner of ours. Uh, they're all keenly interested in uh, you know where we are, where we've been, what's our growth look like, how are we impacting and, and affecting students, and they're very interested um, in the job skills aspect of luthiery, is, uh, which is the the trade of repairing and building stringed instruments of all kinds, um, and. I get, I get a number of emails from a couple of the folks about, um, you know, the trades aspect of it, the, the work, and it's such a good thing, you know, baby boomers are retiring, and, uh, you know, there are all these guitars, Fender makes more guitars than you can even imagine, they don't even know where they go, they've stopped asking the question, you know, 10 years ago, they don't even worry about where the guitars go, it's just, they're making like 1,200 guitars in a shift in, in just in one plant, and they have several plants. Um, and all those instruments are going to need repairs at some point. They're going to need fixing. They're going to need modifications if a player comes in and says, I want to change this or that, and they don't know and need a tech to do it. And while some of the instruments might be made overseas, you're not going to send it overseas for repair. Uh, and so like so many things, the guitar is just one of them um, that needs service and the kinds of attention to detail, like Dave just mentioned, and the pride in the work that you do uh, comes back again in the finesse that plywood box with the two by fours, you can bang it together and it may be functional, but the finesse aspect of it to make it the difference between something that's crudely made and very finely done um, comes in with the guitar. And the folks on our advisory panel are very, seem to be very appreciative of the fact that we are imparting this to students, that we're passing along these things. We, we're showing people how to do uh, particular jobs like fret work and the string nut and the overall setup and adjusting the truss rod. These are things that um, you know, you would pay a pretty hefty amount to go into a guitar shop and have that work done. And we're, that's just part and parcel of, of the package of what we're doing along with the math and the science. Beautiful. Thank you very much. So we're getting ready to open up the questions to the audience. We'd like for you to uh, move towards the microphones that you see stationary uh, here. Um, I ask one question and I'll give you a moment to think about your question and engage them as well. So, uh, Tim. Yes, sir. Last day of class, guitars are in hand, product there. Take us down what that smells like, what it seems like, the energy in the room, and what happens to the guitar at the end of the day. Well, I might do it a little different than, than some schools do. Being a community college, the way I'm set up, students don't buy kits. Uh, I have a lab fee that's built in that covers the cost of the kits, and I warn them at the beginning of the semester. This raw kit has educational value. And if you do not finish that guitar perfectly per the rubric, there's still educational value there, and that's my guitar to use in the next semester. 
Um, but if you finish it, you've used up all the educational value, you can take it home. So, so they, they, they really like uh, finishing it and finishing it well. Um, and as a lab fee, I've gotten it approved as a technical elective for two programs so far. Uh, if they're on financial aid, that covers their lab fee, so they walk away with the equivalent of a four to $600 guitar that you know, they built themselves. Wow. Last day of class, a few things that come to mind. Um, I had a, a Marine veteran in uh, my class last semester. Um, I don't think he was serious post-traumatic stress, but a touch of that. And he was real quiet at first and didn't engage much. By the end of the semester, he took his guitar, he played it, and he was an awesome guitar player. And uh, as he was walking out the door, he did that thing where you jump up and kick your heels together <laughs> and turn around and give everybody a thumbs up. I also had one student come up to me uh, very last day and said to me, I want to thank you for saving my life. And I said, what are you talking about? I didn't do CPR or anything. He said, no, no, no. He said, you don't understand. He said, when I came in here, I was convinced I was going to fail. He said, I had never used any tools before growing up. He grew up in a household without a father and, and didn't have any guidance from mom for how to use a hammer and a screwdriver. And by the end of the semester, he said, now I feel like I can do anything. And he said, so I'm going to pursue something I had been reluctant about because I thought I might fail at that. I'm going to go on. I'm going to get my bachelor's degree, and I want to be a physics teacher. So wow. we translated from yeah. building a guitar to becoming a physics teacher. And, and that's the kind of impact it seems to have on the students. That's beautiful. Sean? Yeah, I agree that confidence boost is huge, especially with the female students who come in who <clears throat> are stripping screws and can't even use a screwdriver at first um, to soldering electronics at the end and using the problem-solving skills. You know, they get it all put together and then it has a buzzing sound. So they have to take it apart and make sure it's grounded properly and um, definitely the confidence at the end is, is huge. That's good. And you're right, Nancy? Um, <laughs> no, I'm trying to give them a moment. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm sure you have some questions. Well, I, I wanted to just also throw in my thoughts on um, student impact. And um, like uh, the other teachers you see here, I'm, students go from you know skipping school and being classified as at-risk students for gra you know, not graduating. And you get them into the guitar building program and like we can all tell you so many stories about students who say, you know, the only reason I came to school today is to work on my guitar. They want to stay late. They want to come in early. They want me to come into the, meet them in the shop on a Saturday. They're, they become, you know, what many people perceive as, you know, lazy and um, uninterested to these highly motivated, passionate learners who can't get enough of all the things they need to know to make sure that their instrument is the best guitar ever built <laughs> and they're going to carry that they sleep with it they carry it through the rest of their lives um, and we we all have examples of students who went from just being you know no, lacking confidence and struggling to just see any point in going to school at all or any reason for learning anything like you know as abstract as math to um, kids who have gone on to um, automotive technology careers or um, computer programming, robotics sometimes is the next step, as, as Eric was saying, and um, coming out on the other end as, you know, our proudest, our proudest um, accomplishment of getting a student who is very confident in going on to college or a tech program or a career path in something that they had never seen themselves doing before. So it changes how you see your, how they see themselves, their confidence level and, and just feeling empowered in what they can accomplish. That's beautiful, thank you. Uh, we have a question here. Could you give your name and school affiliation? Sure, my name is Laura Lemire and I'm the engineering department chair at the Community College of Baltimore County. Beautiful, thank you Laura. And I was looking to really look at implementation. Um, so at the community college, first of all, how many credits um, is a class? Um, how many hours does it require? <laughs> and um, the other thing is I've had issues with the person who runs my workshop area, um, who's a CAM coordinator, very concerned about safety, where he wants our students to take a three or four credit CAM class in order to learn how to use the equipment. 
So if you have any suggestions on how to deal with that, with this course or in general, <laughs> and then um, credits and number of hours. Well, mine is initially a two credit hour course, uh, not by design, by, by intention, because that was what I was stuck with for the default special projects course. It probably would be better placed at a three credit hour course, That's what we would need, um, yeah. because I'm putting in about four credit hours worth of time and getting paid for two, which is fine because it's fun, I love it. Um, so that's how that part goes, credit hour wise. Uh, on your safety, um, our students, not necessarily before the class, but as part of the curriculum, we have a safety course that involves OSHA 10, first aid, CPR, and the whole thing, but uh, we talk about safety each week before we go in to learn a new tool. All students are required to wear safety glasses. We have respirators in the lab. I make the respirators optional. I'd say if you want to line your lungs with sawdust, that's okay with me. Um, but uh, we also go over all the safety procedures for each tool. No, do not leave your thumb there as you're pushing the wood through the bandsaw, things like that. <laughs> um, and so you just have to kind of stay on top of it. And I task the students to sort of keep an eye on each other as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, from the center. Thank you. I'm Olga Valerio. I'm from El Paso Community College and I entered into the Advanced Technology Center. I'm responsible for all the trades programs at El Paso Community College. And I really like what are you doing, guys, and especially because the dropout students that we have in El Paso, uh, we are close to the border to Juarez, to Mexico, and our area is kind of really poor. You know, we don't make too much money. The, the base salary for the work class, yeah, I wanted to call like this way, is seven dollars and we have many drop out students from the high schools and they wanted to go because they believe it, they don't know how to do it to the trades to the electrical to HVAC to electronics uh, drafting but I like this program I watching the map and you don't have any project in Texas and I would like to be one of the project in Texas and want to be the first one to implant this one at El Paso, Texas. I would like to know with who I have to be in contact with you guys, who can be the perfect person to so, help me. Yeah, <laughs> Mr. Um, Tom Singer. So, Tom, would you please stand up, right turn here. around. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's the guy you want to see. And I just want to take a moment and plug Tom Singer for a second at Sinclair Community College. He does a fantastic job of organizing uh, the manufacturing and the production uh, working with a number of dedicated student techs uh, to actually make kits, fabricate kit pieces, and box and ship things out for schools that don't have fabrication f um, capability at their schools. Um, and he's definitely the person you want to see about hosting an event at your school. I would like to help the students. And I related with some of you. I used to play steel drums. And when I was doing my PhD, I don't know anything about music. I don't know how to play drums and nothing. Coming from Mexico, I said, what kind of heck is this one? <laughs> how am I going to play steel drums? I have to learn the science behind material science, physics, frequency, show waves, and everything. And really, really congratulate you guys. That's an amazing project. But like I said, I wanted to be part of the project and help to the students. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. OK. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Peggy Weeks, and I'm an external evaluator on a number of awesome ATE projects and centers. Um, and I'm really glad, Nancy, to hear about your story about assessment, because I think that is really a critical piece. But I have a question for you. I have a sister, and she's an awesome high school science, or high school um, math teacher. Um, she's an engineer by training. I'm an engineer by training. And we have conversations all the time. We, oh, and by the way, we absolutely loved math when we were in, in high school. I mean, we, that's why we went into engineering, right? Because we absolutely love math. But we love math just for the sake of doing math. My sister has a lot of students who, <laughs> frankly, don't like math, right? She teaches at a very small, private Catholic high school. My question for you is, um, how can I engage her in a conversation about STEM guitar building, and do you think it's feasible at a small, private, Catholic school to do something like that? 
Yes, I would say absolutely is it, not only that it's feasible, but it's, it, it's, it's the next thing she needs to do. I mean, I cannot even recommend it more highly than I, we already have. But um, I would say the, the first step would be to get her to apply for one of the summer guitar building institutes that we've been talking at, about a little bit here. But what that is is a week-long workshop. There are all over the United States. Um, uh, Tom is just releasing a few of the sites. I know there will be one in Texas um, next summer, from what I understand. And um, if uh, I, the, there's an application process that's online at guitarbuilding.org, and then there's a, a selection process that goes through that. But um, if she is selected, which I'll, if you give me her name, I'll make sure. <laughs> oh, but, um, um, yeah. <laughs> um, then. The, um, the entire week-long workshop is no cost to the educator, and um, all of the um, parts of building the guitar that you don't already know how to do, so she, like I understood the math part, but that was about it. But the curriculum that comes with the program is so comprehensive, it's all right there, and you know, lesson plans are already there for the math and the science and the technology and engineering pieces, so you don't have to recreate anything, you're really just facilitating that with your own students. And, Actually, starting out with a small class of maybe 10 students or less is, I would recommend that anyway in your first you know, attempt, and then you can build up to more students. But um, as far as getting her interested in that, I would go on the guitarbuilding.org website, and we have um, a video that um, our photographer had made that shows students building guitars, and it has catchy music to it. And watching that uh, and just going through the um, the different parts of the website that will show all the impact and how it works. Great. Thank you so much, Nancy. And everybody else, too. Yep, thank you. Celeste Carter, National Science Foundation. And this is really a, a little bit of an outgrowth of everything you've said, both, both on the faculty side and student side. One of the things you've done is develop communities of practice, right? You've, you've developed students that want to be there building their guitar, loving music, understanding everything they're doing. Do, what do you guys do after the class is over? We've talked about the last day of class. From the faculty's perspective, I would, I would bet that these students keep in contact with you. And how many groups have been formed? Donald mentioned the Beatles being here. <laughs> What's going on with the music end? Well, I don't know that there's a lot that happens after they leave the class, but an experience I had, I'm only teaching it now for the second time, I had four students from the previous semester ask, could we please come to the first meeting of the next group? And they brought their guitars without any instigation on my part. They took up the whole first half hour of class showing off their guitars and, and engaging with the students in the new group coming in. And then they hung around for lecture and of course, each time you teach something, you try to improve it. I added a lot more to the first week's material. And they said, well, you did a whole bunch more this time than you did last time. Can we stay for the whole semester? I, sorry, there's not enough room. But um, they do keep coming back and engaging. They come into the lab during lab time. And, and they actually help me work with the other students. So it really is like a community. And I can attest to that as well. Eric was a ninth grader when he took the class. And then as a 10th grader, he came back and volunteered as a TA, and then he's here now. He missed a midterm yesterday to fly here, and he's <laughs> flying out in an hour to do some more midterms. So anyway, it definitely does stick with them. Yeah, I would, I would follow up on that as well, um, the whole idea of community. I've got uh, a lot of underclassmen that come back, you know, 10th, 11th graders that come back there for, again, to build a guitar, or maybe they're away for a year because their scheduling doesn't allow it, but they come back and they take the class a second time, uh, and it, they're a valuable asset because uh, like Tim was saying, they, they help the other students that are the first timers. And so um, you get sort of this cyclical kind of thing where there's, there's guitar one and there's guitar two for some of these guys. It's real informal, it's not on paper or anything, but it does work out like Sean and, and Tim had, had talked about. May I add one more thing? Yes. Yeah. Somebody asked earlier about 21st century skills. Mm -hmm. And with our advisory committee, they don't talk about 21st century skills, they talk about soft skills. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that really comes out of this course is work ethic. I mean, they're, they are beating me up, will you please open the lab so we can go in and work. 
and uh, teamwork. I mean, they're all helping each other and working together. And, and the soft skills are something that is an unforeseen blessing that comes from this course. And then when they go out there, they have a sense of what those soft skills are like, and the employers appreciate that greatly. I know, uh, for me as a student, I, I live in uh, Syracuse, New York, and I took my class in uh, uh, Washington State, near Seattle. Um, and if I could come back, I, I would every day. <laughs> but uh, here I am hanging out with you guys, uh, and really after the class, um, as far as community goes, it made me want to be part of the community. It, makes, it made me want to be part of the STEM research project. And uh, because of that, I'm changing my career course. I was uh, recently working in the financial department, and now I am positive this is what I want to do, because I didn't know this was a job. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds too fun. William, anything? <laughs> yes. Yes, okay. Uh, we have one last question over here. Okay, sorry, I'm last question. It's a very interesting session. Uh, I am with Flate. My name is Richard Gilbert. Flate is an organization in Florida. And we had Tom come down and uh, do a workshop with one of the high schools. And if you do this, just get out of the way because the high school is just going to take over and run it. And, and that's what happened in Florida. Now the serious question, because I would really like to play, and I do play, but left-handed is the way. And so there might be an, I didn't ask Tom, but there might be a step. I saw that. Well, I didn't see him play. What, what are you going to do with us left-handed players? Because uh, You can be accommodated. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. There's another related question that I haven't heard. What about that four-string guitar? The bass. Yes. We, we, we have bases too. Yeah. Yes. We so get our bases covered. There is diversity there. This is good. Oh, we have another question. Yes, please, please. Um, hello, my name is Samantha Vetta. I attend St. Phillips College. I'm an intern at TMMTX in the assembly department at uh, Toyota. And my safety commitment is I will make sure I understand all procedures before conducting any task. In my program as a student, I understand that we do, we do change the way we think and we do change like, time management. We get to work early. Is there other ways other than the way your students learn? Did you notice the way they interacted with their families or with their friends or their time management? Well, I can say I'll start this one. Um, I, well, I, I'm going to use this a particular student as an example. So. Uh, Maybe four years ago, I had a student who was really intelligent but had absolutely no motivation to do anything academic. He was taking pre-algebra, and I could see right away that that was way too easy for him. And I told him, so you need to move up to Algebra 1. And he said, oh, no, you don't understand. I want to do the easiest class you have. <laughs> you know, and he was like that, and just, you know. And so I went, okay, fine. And he was already a guitar player, so I, I, I lured him, you know, how do you like this, you know, holding him <laughs> up. I have guitars in my classroom. So he took guitar building, and after that first um, semester, he, com he really became a completely different person. His, his, the way he talks, the way he walked, his whole entire attitude, and um, like a lot of the people you see here, he became a TA in my class Every year after that, he just graduated this past spring. But the following year, he ended up signing up for algebra and geometry and taking two math classes simultaneously to really get up to where he needed to be. Um, just after doing math as part of the project, he realized, oh, this is fun doing it this way. But um, to answer your question, it, it also changed his presence in the community. He, from, he went from just being kind of that, the slacker guy, the lazy kid, to um, uh, in the yearbook, uh, by the end of that first year, he was voted most mathematical, <laughs> which was really funny to the kids in his, the other kids two years younger than him in pre-algebra. But um, and um, anyway, it really it did. He he uh, he's now at college and he's doing advanced woodworking and working in a cabinet shop and helping us teach guitar building in the summer. And it it, it I, I and I can say I. 
I have a hundred more stories just like that, you know, that there's show, there's, well, we just made a picture storybook that Tom has some examples of, and there's a page in there that shows kids sharing their guitars with family and friends and community, and you can just see the look on their faces and the way they carry themselves. It, it's different than they were before the project. If I can jump in as well, uh, being at a public high school, our guidance counselors quite often will put kids into the guitar building course who have not been successful, pretty much period, hoping that a hands-on class will be effective. And my class typically meets on the first block of the day at 7.40 in the morning, which is not necessarily the best hour for many of these students. And once they get into class, they tend to get to class ahead of time. They are at class. Rather than being disengaged, they're the ones that are standing right there, paying attention, learning how to use the tools safely, learning how to set things up. And their whole approach really improves. And sometimes that even carries into their other classes. So we get them to school, we get them started off strong, and they do better for it. Not always, but we have had some pretty phenomenal successes that way. I would, I would follow up with that, that um, it's a slow transformation. When you start school at the beginning of the school year and for the first few months, and we are, we're still in that first few months phase, it seems like, oh, we've got all year to do this. We have all year to do this. And so if they're not successful other places, they may start off with the same characteristics in, in my class also. And we talk about tool safety and machine safety, and you know they have to be reminded and retake quizzes because they didn't do so well. But as we progress, as we get closer to the end of the year, and more of the car guitar is completed, and yes, it's painted, and now the neck has frets in it, and, and now there's this glint of light at the end of the tunnel. There's this transformation, not all at once. It's a gradual thing, and where you really see it kick in is, uh, you know, in like March, April time frame, is stuff is, is thing, major phases are coming to, coming to completion. And to answer a previous question, I try to finish the guitars about three or four weeks before the end of the school year so we can learn how to play some chords and stuff a little bit, so they're not leaving with something that they don't know how to use. Um, and so the closer we get to the end, the more real the deadline is of the end, and the more um, the focus they get. And let's face it, in large part, that's human nature. When we've got, we're faced with a big project, and it's like, well, it's easy to put things off and put things off. And as the deadlines approach, um, it makes you kind of get more serious about it. And the real interesting thing is when they come back that second year to help out, or to take a class a second time, and they stand there with their arms folded, and they were the kids that were that the first half of the school year, the first three months of the school year, didn't take it as seriously maybe as they should have. They're standing there with their arms folded, tisk tisk tisk. These guys, these newbies, they just they need to get their act together, aren't they? <laughs> Mr. Hunt, how are they ever going to get this done? They're just so backwards and so confused. It's like how much you've forgotten in 12 months, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one more thing to add on to what Doug says: it's not just as the class gets closer to the end; it's as any single student gets closer to the end. There's a competition thing that kind of kicks in, which is also a little bit of human nature. They don't want to be perceived as being behind. So one student pulling ahead a little bit motivates everybody to move ahead. That's great. Anyone else? Anything to add? Well, I just wanted to add, because I think one of the things that you were touching on was that how does it affect individual students outside of that classroom, outside of that setting? and all I can speak to is, at least in, in my course, the one that I took, there was a level of camaraderie, or I guess just opening up. People come out of their shells. I mean, once you empower a person to take pride and ownership in something, I mean, that finished product is, you just, that, that sense of pride can be overwhelming. And some people who've never had something like that, it totally transforms them into just more friendly, more outgoing, more, yeah, I'll take that risk, it's worth it, because the payoff at the end can, can be life-changing. It can be, I can do this, I can, I can. And, and that can be anything. I can talk to that person, I can apply for that job, I can do anything. And, and it, you're sharing that experience with so many other people that just bolsters that that just reinforces it. Because you see, so can they. It's possible. I can work with that crazy
crazy tool that looks like it'll eat me alive. <laughs> you know, you can. And I think that that's the, the transformation. That's outside of there, mentoring uh, siblings uh, or family members or friends, motivating someone to take the class that wouldn't have anything like that. I think that's the transition or the transformation that can happen. Beautiful, thank you. So, we're at a time. We would like to give the last word to our panelists. Think about an aha moment. Think about something that you want to transfer your knowledge or experiences to this uh, illustrious group. Think about something that you know will make a difference or have made a difference in your life with this program. Showcase to the NSF and the American Association of Community Colleges how much you appreciate this program. Starting with Dave, and we'll proceed right on down the line. One of the things that I take away from this program is this has given me the opportunity to reach a much broader range of students in a very meaningful way. So it's a, it's a program that, a, that works for students across genders, across skill capabilities, whether they have mathematical skills or don't think they do, whether they have social skills or don't think they do, mechanical skills or don't think they do. I've, I've seen a really broad range of students get drawn into this and really blossom and grow from it. And I see that more so than I see in other classes. So I, I really appreciate the, the, how big an umbrella this uh, program is able to serve. Um, what I take from this class is my hands-on skills. I found are a lot better in my math and science skills. It's helped me a lot in all my other classes and just being able to work with my hands and being able to do just the, all the different things I wasn't able to do before. Um, I would like to let you know that if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> you know, my, my biggest skill is solving, you know, uh, simplifying polynomials. <laughs> so <laughs> this has added a lot to my skill set. And if you're trying to engage students, and I think of it especially with math and also with science and the other topics, you, you just owe it to yourself and your students to do this project. I tried a lot of other projects that you know, had some appeal, but this is the only one that going on my fourth year, it, it's more popular and has a higher impact every year that that we do it, and this can s truly transform uh, a student who is so fearful of failure that they want to take the easiest class you have into somebody who takes math all the way through high school into college and sees themselves as a mathematician. For me, um, this has opened up a whole new career path. Um, it's given me motivation and a direction to move in. I'm definitely set on going back to school and getting my uh, teacher certificate and hopefully uh, being more involved with the STEM program. I would, I would say two things. One, it's uh, incredibly rewarding in a way I could have never imagined uh, to hear from other teachers at the summer workshops. Thank you for doing this for us. Um, this, is, this, is changed, this is changing or this has changed uh, my teaching career. Um, and wherever they were in their teaching profession, they would come in and do a workshop and a year later, six months later, uh, you know, they're, they're excited about what they're doing, their first batch of guitars, and they send pictures of their first class. Uh, the second thing I would, I would add is, I'm sure you've all seen the movie The Karate Kid, um, and all the different aspects of painting the fence and waxing the car, and uh, my relationship with God has been much like that the last 20 years, and I find myself a lot of times asking, what am I doing here? Why am I here? What's my purpose? This has become my purpose. Without all the other experiences I had before this, I could not have designed guitar bodies and necks. I couldn't have implemented production of fretboards uh, and kept pace with, a, with a, uh, Sinclair, what they're doing. And um, I would not have been able to be the, the team member with, with the group of co-PIs and, and Tom, Tom Singer is the principal investigator to the extent that I have been. Um, and so I have landed into my purpose. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not sure I'm totally grasping the intent of the question here, but uh, just a few comments. Everything up to this point is high school, and I'd like to encourage, and I know there are a lot of high schools doing this, but I want to encourage other community colleges to consider adding this into the curriculum as well. An advantage that a community college has is the mix of students 
you can get in your class. You know, in a high school class, you've got, well, they're 14 to 18 and you're done. I have students that range from 18 to 60. Um, and here's the kind of thing that can come from that. This semester, I have someone from Fermilab who drives down to take the STEM guitar course. And he is engaging with some of the younger students in the class and helping them. And what an advantage to have somebody from Fermilab in there helping with your, your STEM education with the younger students in class. And you have older people too who have even more experience than I've had with tools and I'll let them, okay, here, let me show you this trick on the bandsaw or whatever. So I, I highly encourage community colleges to take this on. It's a great public relations tool. We have had newspapers in taking pictures of students and articles. There was a, I don't know if it was front page or second page of the paper, hey dude, look what I built, you know? <laughs> and, and, a, and a whole big long article about it. We also engaged with local business. We had a local music store uh, come in and give all the students gift certificates uh, for discounts at the store, even if it's on sale, you get 20% off or whatever, and uh, congratulate the students. And the TV show, The Voice, one of the uh, contestants from a year or two ago who made the finals, his name was uh, Lupe Carroll. He happens to be a hometown boy. And Lupe is gonna be coming to class this semester to uh, encourage the students and play their guitars and things like that. So. Um, there's a lot you can do that to help build community engagement with the college as well. Beautiful, thank you. Um, to the NSF and the AACC, thank you for the opportunity to prove to myself that the sky is the limit, or not even, the exterior reaches of our galaxy, maybe. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, like to consider that I could do Anything, that I would be in Washington, D.C. with a great panel um, talking to the ATE. I just feel that there's a plethora of opportunities now. There, I can handpick a direction that, that never would have occurred to me. So thank you. So I think the distinction about this project that got me involved initially is the hook of the guitar. And I think that works with the students as well and definitely with my administration. Um, seeing that we're going to build a guitar and then STEM is kind of an added bonus on top of that. And um, so there was a question about a small private school and the Grower School is a small private school of 150 students, college preparatory high school. And um, the, the, we don't even have a wood shop. So if we can do it without a wood shop and as someone mentioned, uh, the, the Sinclair Community College has different levels of prefabrication. So you can build it from a block of wood and do the CNC routing yourself, or you can start with more prefabricated objects. So it really shouldn't be a limitation if there's no wood shop or no previous wood shop training. I just want to say that I was so lucky and I'm so thankful that this program existed <clears throat> um, because it pushed me to where I am now. Uh, it pushed me into robotics and then from there I wanted to pursue a degree in electrical engineering and computer engineering. And <clears throat> I don't know, I just love the program. That's all I'm gonna say, yeah. <laughs> I think that puts it together. <laughs> Give them a hand. <laughs> in, in my closing remarks, we all are striving to bring real world hands on project based learning and that whole train of thought that we do. This is it. You know, we evaluators, this is to you. Yeah, we can't get you all that fancy data. Yeah, they produce it. But this is a lot of emotion that you can't bottle. But they know now the passion that they have discern from the program, if you will, that others are watching them as rock stars, and you can't beat that. It sells itself. So, in closing, I can't thank the National Science Foundation, the American Association of Community College, and the, their confidence in making something like this real. And I encourage you, we got guitars, yes, they talked about bass, but we got banjos. We have a whole wide world of other areas that we can use to bring in that real world learning. And it's transferable to other skills. I've heard about NASA, I've heard about other organizations that wants these type of skills that's real in the workplace. 
21st century skills, soft skills, and all these things are very important. So I can't thank you all enough. Please enjoy the rest of the conference. And more importantly, come up and meet our rock stars. And they're going to transition into playing you right on out to the stage. Thank you. Thank you.